thank you for the kind presentation and uh, thank you for having me here. It's very it's great uh, actually to have the opportunity of uh, sharing with you some of our results, but also to collect your feedback, your you know your ideas it will be really really important. Um, it's very important for me. And I just want to say uh, I'm going to read some of the slides because uh, you know I'm getting old and I'm losing stuff. So, and it would be a pity. And also another important thing to mention before starting is that um, this presentation is designed to not just to jump into the technology directly. I also would like to a bit present the way of how we reach such a conclusion, meaning what does it mean virtual reality for us? Uh, what does it mean actually uh, using virtual reality for uh, identifying new creative patterns in research and so on. So, and also of course, it referred very much to archeological material, but I believe that this can really be extended to many different fields. Uh, both to actually, we engage quite a lot with other fields as well. So let's see if this works. So yes, uh, no. <laughs> mm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, here. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, my name is. It's, it's, it's really introduced. It's Nicola De Luca, I'm a professor in digital archaeology at the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History here in Lund, and I'm also the uh, scientific coordinator of the Arc Lab, the Lund University Digital Archaeology uh, Lab, which is. Uh, um, based as a facility in the uh, at the Department of Archaeology and deal with a large amount of projects really adding in different directions, but all of course focused on spatial analysis, 3D visualization, and archaeology. Uh, the project which I'm going to show are now, mm -hmm. yes, are now of course, uh, well, are the result of many different. Uh, it works, uh, and of course, there is a lot of people involved. Actually, I just noticed that a few people are missing a few new uh, elements of the of the labs. But uh, yeah, you see, this the old one. Sorry for that. Yeah, but there are there are of course many people involved from uh, postdoc, PhD uh, lecturers. So, and of course, the the, the lab is structured also. In a lot of in kind from different actors within the department, plus funding from the faculties and from different projects. But still, it is um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very large work. And what should, what's, what actually we do very much is that we deal a lot with technology in the field. So we use it in the field to help us in identifying new patterns, to analyze materials in a different way, and for extending our capacity of understanding the field. Because archaeology. Uh, is very destructive. So basically, when we pass, we destroy. We remove forever the layer, and then we progress. So the documentation part is crucial, and also the possibility for us to analyze in the material, uh, you know, in the document, documenting and analyzing the material in the best possible way is really the, the core of the whole process. So, um, yeah, it, it, we we were established as a. Um, <coughs> University infrastructure in 2017, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so we're quite young infrastructure, but we have been uh, uh, active in many different uh, fields uh, with a good, very good network, uh, with you know very good impact in publications, it's in scientific publication in different fields, but also in projects with really external funding. And now our idea is that we would like to expand also for external users because we've got a lot of contacts with uh, police forces. Uh, museums, uh, uh, land steels, and uh, forest industry. So we, we believe that, well, of course, we, believe, we, we got this very positive feedback on the fact that this can actually be uh, also interesting in other, in other fields. So, but now let's go to the point of um, what does it mean, uh, the third dimension? So how do we use the third dimension, right? Because actually, you know, you use it every day. Also, the, the concept of virtuality, you have been using probably right now, and you certainly use it today, and certainly is part of what you are today. So it's not about technology, really. It is about understanding uh, what we want to do with our capacity as human beings to, um, to construct, to, to idealize, to conceptualize, and then to create. So, but from an archaeological perspective, I would say that after a phase where virtual archaeology was uh, mainly theorized for being used as an illustrative tool. So something basically to represent an image. Uh, around 2000, archaeologists start considering virtual space as a tool for discovery. 
And this was actually particularly interesting. So it was not just to make pretty pictures, really, but it was actually to understand, to see if we could achieve a better, deeper understanding of it. Uh, and of course, this was the next slide. Yes. So among the first interesting discussion concerning the virtual space in support of knowledge production, we find this very interesting book, which is a behind illustration of Bernard Frischer and Anastasia Duco de Hill. And in specific, Frischer, in this very first publication, he start discussing about uh, uh, um, virtual reality in terms of heuristic modeling. So something that was already theorized by uh, um, other scholars in being, you know, I mean, they say, well, if I have an atlas of information, like a sort of a, of a Lego, we can say, <laughs> or if I actually start combining different pieces and better understanding from the top, can I actually understand more? And actually, Frischer, not just in here, but also in other publications, he demonstrated, for example, how few hypotheses from the Roma, from the Arafashis in Rome were absolutely wrong. So it could actually explain exactly why this was wrong and why actually, so it could observe the phenomenon, reproduce it, and then understanding, which in science is pretty, I would say normal procedure, but when actually you start entering, entering with social science and all, you know, with heritage, it starts being extremely complex. So having something which allows you to control all this is really, really valuable. But this was actually in the 2000s. And then we have instead uh, this interesting other book, Cyber Archaeology, about Forte. And Maurizio Forte described virtual archaeology as a static, graphic, and orient graphic oriented disciplines, incapable of providing anyone, also archaeologists, with the tools for simulating a potential past. So by introducing the concept of cyber archaeology, Forte shifts the focus on simulation rather than visualization. So describing a discipline where interpretation occurs as a result of a dynamic exchange of information between user and the digital environment. So it is very interesting, this part. So it's not anymore just we producing a 3D model and we using it. Actually, we collect the data from it. We understand, you know, in a very, uh, in, in, a, in a very strong exchange and we, and we are actually able to move on in a, in a different direction. My favorite from all the others is actually Match Edgeworth. He wrote this um, uh, seminar, a very interesting paper titled From Spade Work to Screen Work. And where indeed he described the digital domain in archaeology, not just as a tool for discovering new information, but as a place for discovery. And this is very important because this is a, something which I believe also art science is facing at the moment, you know, is not making an analysis to get the result. It is actually, uh, the virtual environment is the place where you actually understand that result, which is a very different concept. It's a, it's a big shift in many senses. And um, he is, by the way, he's actually an ethnoarchaeologist. So he study how archaeologists document, or, you know, it's, it's extremely very, it is a very interesting perspective. He underlines, this is also, how using computers for modeling and visualizing archaeological data impacts the organizational and political structure of the discipline. He also argued that computer representation can be used for challenging theories and ideas at the very same level as tangible materials, reinforcing the idea that those have effect far behind the sphere of discovery. So engaging with this is changing more or less everything. And also think today, very often also when I speak with the students, uh, it's changing very quickly because you know they're all into social media and everything. But image, for example, how much social media impact your life, how many relation, physical relation you actually you can build also in research without actually meeting that person. Everything actually happened uh, within. Let me talk about collective intelligence, for example. So everything happened in the virtual space, much more than what we think. For us, it's like all you know normal today, but it is not. It is something actually we are encountering, and this is affecting as much as we say. The disciplines, all the disciplines in a very political way or in a very structural level. So, um, but now a big question, <clears throat> how did they tell us to use it? Because, you know, the way what we think virtual reality or 3D um, um, should supposed to be used, it's not really something that we, we reach by our own. We're all the cultural products, right? So we are all, you know, uh, in a way, products of our society. So, and if we actually are going to look at how we conceptualize virtual reality, this comes very much from actually the cyberpunk literature. Uh, oh, for example, Meta, Facebook, Metaverse. Well, you know, it's this guy who actually invented the word Metaverse in a, in a novel, Snow Crash, fantastic, by the way. The Necromancer from Gibson. So fantastic literature, in which actually 
people used to go to move really <laughs> physically in a, in a different domain and doing other, other things. So they talk about having a sort of two passports, right? So the people, the, the person who was living in this world was another person from where actually this person was moving on, on the different world. Yeah, yeah, I can see your face. So where is it going? Well, I can actually tell you that you probably recognize this, don't you? The Matrix, Tron, the Lunar Mower Man. So there were actually all of them, all this literature we have been seeing across the years, it is about this. The Lone Mower Man is very weird guy, you know, taking care of gardeners, and then, you know, he refugee into this garage, he plugged himself into this system, and he was in another world. Different people. Uh, Tron, fantastic. An arcade game, you need to win the arcade game before getting into the other world. There's not really much connection between you. So you are world one or the other. Matrix, here we are in the age of why. No wireless. Why? Do you remember the, the, uh, the fiber? Do you remember how Neo used to go in, in, in Matrix? He was plucked from the back, exactly like a computer. And then he was in a different dimension, a different person. You see, division is completely untouched. And this is 2015, player number one, basically the same context. The only thing that is changing is that today we all used it, right? So, of course, the new movie has this. So, my point is, this is really. This is really it. This is the way of how actually virtual reality or this approach has been pictured to us. But I doubt it is actually a reality. I fairly believe, as much will say, that this actually is very much embedded in everyday life, in what we do every day. And this actually is the only way to making to be sure that this actually has an effect in our also in our way of how we perform science. Um, Yes. So, again, the digital dimension is part of our everyday life. Uh, if used properly, it amplifies our capacity as human beings to define your knowledge. It is a place for thinking, where it is possible to take different perspectives, and most importantly, to gain the grand picture. And Dale Kahneman, who was a, a Nobel Prize for, for economy in 2006, he, with his you know, seminal work, remind us our limits in handling complexity and large data sets. We rely on technology to progress in our research, to identify new practice, and to solve complex, complex processes. But we need to engage with it properly. So we cannot easily deal today with big data. We have them available, but actually are not made for us, are made for something else to be mediated with us. We cannot think to big data without actually having a system for managing them, to collecting them to regroup them and better understanding. So I think the shift of this whole discussion, it is about this space between the data, the big data, and actually us. All right, so, um, and now another question. Why is it so difficult to use this new data to promote creative practices? Because it's not so immediate, right? And, uh, we recently, me and a colleague of mine from the University of York, James Taylor, we wrote, we tried to <laughs> theorize this. We wrote an article called The Scalophism of Practice. So here you can reach the article also, you know, by the way, all the, there are all citations or quotes, so you can, you can get it. And we've been, you know, discussing a lot because we were saying, why when I make a 3D model, people ask me if I can actually make a session or, you know, a plan. You have a 3D model. Why do you want a session on a plan? So it is a lot of overwork and probably happened to you the same. So you have you deal with incredible data and very often the common practice requests you to produce reports of information in a very, let's say, old style. There's nothing wrong with the old style as far as actually doesn't interfere with our capacity to progress. So, and we came to the conclusion that this is all normal. And we also need to embrace this, let's say, slowness is a process. We are human beings, but uh, you know, after all. So we think, that the first part is the emulation. So in which actually, when you have a new technology, what you do, you use this new technology in the very same way you were using the old one. So actually this is kind of studied quite a lot in design, especially in the way, for example, of phones or many other tools are used. So I mean, we need it as human beings. But as soon as actually you start engaging with it, you start to socialize with this tool. And when the socialization part is done, then you start the transformation part you transform, you are actually able to create new practice. So that's why having a newly flashy 
uh, you know, instruments or center or anything, it doesn't make the magic immediately. It takes time because we are humans and we work like that. But my point is, if we actually can control this, if we can have this under our nose and using actually um, as a tool for understanding where we are, probably we will uh, be more effective. I'll give an example about that because I want to be self-critical. So <clears throat> 2013, Chongalo Yu, we did this fantastic uh, experiment, all 3D, you know, like, uh, because, you know, in archaeology, we work with deposits, context. We have all the 3D context, you know, uh, we are going to simulate the sequence of context. We are going to remove, document and remove. Yeah, that was really nice and so on. And then, you know, if you look at Harris, this was a PhD in 1979 of a student who wrote this very seminar. This is actually the most used method now. It means stratigraphy or single context method. And then he actually designed this idea of uh, creating graphic schemes of how actually we remove the material. Because in archaeology, what is on top is younger and so on. But in his book in the 70s, he already said, well, you know, sessions and plans are because we simulated 3D. And what we need to do is basically, in a granular way, to understand all the single part. So my point is, where is the innovation? We were so non-innovative. We were just, you know, using technology, which was available, to do something which was theorized in the 1979. Now, I was very frustrated when I started thinking about that, but then I realized, well, this is not really a problem. If we look at some time, I think that this theory, which we have been formulated, is much more justifying the fact that we are not so nobody, but however. So in reality, and uh, this is actually the movie, but uh, let's see if I, no, oh, sorry. Ba, 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 ba. I hope I... Yes, uh, yes, if you click on it. So we've been start, no? Yeah, so we've been start thinking, uh, I think if you click on this directly, should no. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, why don't we actually try to use the 3D model in the field, you know, and see what's happened when people start engaging with it. And we actually did a lot of experiments in it. It was extremely fascinating because it was changing the way we practice archaeology. It was changing the way we communicate in the field, the way we exchange information with each other. And actually, the, in this case, archaeologists were using the 3D GIS simulation for looking at how contexts were already removed, gone two years before or the year before. That was extremely fascinating to see from actually an ethno-archaeological perspective, because you could see how it is really true that these techniques have the possibility of changing our practices. And of course, reaching, I'm not saying better, but certainly very different conclusions. We don't mention the fact that we have all the materials potentially available in the field, something you don't have, because usually you have them when they're clean, dry, and actually archived. And you don't have all the specialists telling you exactly what is what, but actually in this case, well, Zubrov talked about the, the, the digital village. Um, Hezra Zubrov uh, described his revolutions in terms of saying, well, the excavation was a very isolated environment. And it is all our environment well, like that, research environments. But now you can be in the middle of the desert, wherever, and actually being connected with the world and sending to a specialist the result that you just excavated before removing them. This is indeed a very big uh, revolution, I would say. Um, and yes, huh. so this theory, uh, is now come to the difficult part, can definitely be applied to all aspects of scientific visualization and in a much larger scale. So in 2014, Christian Christiansen defined what he calls the third science revolution in archaeology. Hard science entered archaeology aggressively, but also created a huge demand in terms of interpretation. So specialists develop, and this is actually the wheel that Christian Christiansen has, I was showing all the different aspects which are coming. And these are, of course, big data. However, specialists develop their approach within their subject, but unfortunately, we don't possess instruments to see these results properly contextualized in the current investigation. So when analysis reach the archeologists, usually the context is gone. And we as humans do not possess the capacity to handle such a huge amount of data in one vision. So in this respect, the possibility of visualizing all these different information in one space is invaluable. There is an interesting um, movie of Woody Allen. It's called Whatever Work. You know, Woody Allen may always this uh, interpreting himself. It's always a good movie, bad movie. So this one, he is not him, but someone looking like him. And he's a genius, of course. 
Um, and it's very funny because at the very end, this is a spoiler, of course. Uh, so at the very end of the movie, someone asks the genius, what would it take to be a genius? And, you know, very seriously answer to get the grand picture. And in a way, this is true. I mean, you need to have the grand picture to understand your data. And the grand picture is not given by the big data, but actually by the media that actually you use to approach your data. So, and this, I believe, it's something deeply missing that we need really to investigate and develop more. So, now, what happens when we take the virtual dimension in the field? I'm actually going now to present some example, I would say, of uh, our past works. And here I will need the movie again. Yeah. So this is Chagalo Yuk. It's an old case study that we developed. But it was particularly fascinating, the fact that in the field, we could really, I mean, with the tablet in our hands, to see every single building. I mean, take into account that this usually excavation can have around 100, 150 archeologists working in the field. It's one of the most famous excavation, actually, I would say, in the, in the, in the last, I mean, you know, it's very, there are these buildings, Arneolithics, so we're talking about 6,000 years ago, and then, uh, you know, every phase, <laughs> every context is removed and it's progressed and has been identifying a number of levels. So, and the big issue here is also this, you can, with the system, you can turn on and off everything, but, you know, this, the staff working here, was one group and they were not connecting or talking with the staff working here. So at the end of the day, we could drag and drop all the model and having a grand picture. And most important, we could see levels which were excavated in very different years. Because you know, excavation teams they go faster or slower, it depends on what they found. But you know, the information is recorded in, the, in separate boxes. And this was not always the possibility to see them all together. Actually, I would say almost impossible. So for us, it was really incredible to say, wow, we can actually, and also the osteologists as well, because these are all variables. You know, they could do their job in 3D, georeferencing the model, then deposited them in the, in the archive. And then at the end of the day, we just drag and drop and we see all this, you know, all the, new, the individuals, all the analysis, all the paintings, everything in one, in one shot. So, but, that's also the moon. Yes, it's going automatically. Uh, I show this very many times in this slide, but I like this. It was a fantastic result for us. So, 2015, I was there. And actually, we were excavating, a team was excavating this the building, the 131. And in archaeology, it's very granular. So, but the wall usually is characterized by two contexts the bricks and the mortar. And then they make a feature. So, they were removing this wall for progressing. And on the bottom, it came out a big piece of clay with some small red okra. Now, this was sent to the conservation lab and it came out a fantastic head. Uh, the one with obsidian highs, uh, really beautiful with several layers of, of conservation done at that time. Um, and so the big question was where it was because it was not easy to find. I mean, yes, in the wall, but the wall is big and it was already on the bottom. So it was particularly interesting because just using the 3D models georeference in the GIS system, it was possible actually to see old models and to find them. Actually, it was, for, was recognized in one of the old models. And then what we did was we made a 3D high resolution model of the feature restored after conservation, and we realigned the model. This was done on site in Turkey. So, uh, directly within the system. So we could actually re-identify the sort of uh, installation and area, which was in a way not lost, but not recognized because, you know, the excavation is linear. And trust me, this happened also on your experiments. I, despite your, 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 you know, your background, we always work, we, we work in narratives. This is how we do. The possibility of going back, see all the elements and actually rewriting these narratives it is really rare because you really need to have elements for constructing it. And you're not anymore there because we write narratives also, you know, with, with, with the moving into this narrative, discussing with others and so on. The possibility of simulating, as Porter was saying, this within a virtual environment, it gave us the possibility of really, in a way, not going back in time, certainly, but to um, <clears throat> re-identify or reanalyze this context. Um, Yes, um, this is also another fantastic case. 
which uh, I enjoy very much, but I only have one slide of this because uh, <clears throat> it will be sufficient. Um, otherwise, it will be too long. This was in Sambivori, was is an archaeological site in the island of Erlang. And I have to say the island because otherwise it's all under Erlang, so it's complicated. <laughs> and this was done in collaboration with the Kalmar County Museum. And this specific experiment was developed at that time with Helen Dielson, that she was a PhD student in our institution in historical osteology at that time, but now she's, of course, a researcher, a very successful researcher working in, in the private commercial account. So, but this was particularly interesting because um, there was, unfortunately, there was uh, some illegal uh, metal detectorists that went there and they actually stole, they identified and stole uh, fantastic uh, materials. So, Len Stevenson, they ordered immediately, you know, uh, an investigation of this. And uh, in uh, uh, 2013, if I'm not wrong, uh, you know, they went with metal detector from the museum and they identified a lot of beautiful golden rouge and, and materials and so on. So they also open a trench, which is, you know, old. <laughs> very small, one meter for one meter and a half. Uh, it's the red, you see the red uh, individual there. It's basically was the size of the trench. And in this trench, surprisingly, came out a human, uh, an individual was, was killed, and another, another part of another individual. So the bones were removed and broke in loot for being studied, but to be, you know. Uh, so the year after, the Kalmar County Museum opened a larger excavation, which we were kindly invited to join. And, uh, you know, it came out, of course, we, we were expecting the rest of the individual number two, um, and also artifacts and, you know, and the house. And what was particularly interesting in here was that this was all in 3D recorded. So at the very end of the, the day, we could drag and drop the different elements and have the, you know, the forensic the reconstruction of the whole event reconstructed, we visual, visualized. What was also particularly interesting is that Helen, she usually, the osteologists, they take all the, you know, the single bones and then they make an analysis and understand, okay, this is, uh, you know, caused by this. And so it's very detailed. So we say, why don't we do this, not, you know, on writing in a, on a white paper as usual, but why don't we do it in a database? So we basically designed a database uh, modeled for offsting all this information. That was particularly interesting because, you know, she could, for example, run a lot of analysis and understanding also, for example, show me all the fracture occurring this month. So, and actually to the question, show us all the fracture in post-mortem, meaning when actually the body were already dead, it came out very parallel pattern. So, which we thought was probably the roof of the house collapsing on the bodies and cracking them. So for us it was particularly interesting because engaging in the, in the, in the virtual the dimension showed that you can definitely identify information which are not visible in the real, you know, in the real space, but even not in the digital space. So again, as Matt was saying, it is actually across these two dimensions with things happens. Also in your life, really, I mean, how much of your business is deal across digital and non-digital nowadays? So why should it be different within our research? In fact, it isn't. So my point is the the more, the quickest we, we engage with him, the better. And this is actually the work of one of our ex-students in collaboration with Miguel Larson and me, uh, John Howard. He actually started also to visualize archaeobotany within the 3D GIS. And it's also very interesting because archaeobotany doesn't have a spatial position. So usually you, you get a sample, right, in a larger context. So you don't have it. It's not like an artifact, but you know what it is. And this is the Utpogra, and it's the area of the Oven. And it was a fantastic, very interesting uh, work because this uh, these also is already, yeah. Um, it basically starts visualizing the, the work of Megan Larson uh, in his archaeobotany analysis directly on the context, something that we usually <coughs> we don't do. We do it in a bidimensional way, and it's not really so clear. And it was extremely interesting to see how the different patterns of different samples, different uh, type of seeds and materials were actually showing, in a way, the activities or the movements or the complexity of the site. Um, So long ago, we also had we really from 2015 and 17, we had the possibility, the opportunity of uh, uh, being uh, awarded with uh, an essence, uh, uh, exactly, uh, an essence project. And we did, I think, um, something that is still used today. So I'm extremely proud of that. So we wanted to understand how we could use supercomputing 
for computing large data set when out in the field. And this is always, you see, it comes from really the needs of, we need this data now in the field. We cannot wait to go back in human processing because we will lose a lot of information. So it's all in on this uh, uh, relation between digital and physical or, or field and not in the field or the digital in the field. So we start engaging a lot also with drones uh, because that was an important component in our work. Today, we collaborate a lot with Aviation University Aviation School. Uh, we have a lot of projects with them and it's extremely interesting, especially considering the sort of sensors that you can actually have nowadays. Uh, but we also start looking at classification. So this is also extremely interesting. It's not just a question of engaging across dimensions, it's also engaging with who? No, certainly not just with humans or researchers. Actually, uh, computers give you interesting feedback, are really agents in many senses, and can, can affect your interpretation quite a lot. So, yes, this we, we had the UAV at the new collaboration project, but I want to show you something more recent. Yeah, you see, and nowadays, this suddenly, from day to night, we had access to LiDAR data from all Sweden. This was actually a few years ago, but what does this mean? Basically, the entire Sweden is mapped in 3D in a kind of fairly good resolution from the north to the south. So Sweden is covered for 83% of the land from forest. And a lot of archeological sites are actually under forest and there's no chance of really identifying them. And it's also dangerous in a way because, you know, forest industry is a big market in Sweden. So land stealers and protecting these, so it's, it's, it's a lot of things. The LiDAR data allow actually you to, with just one software, to remove entirely the forest and see what is under forest. And the LiDAR data you're seeing here has only four points for square meters, and only 20% of these points are actually visible under forest. Today, we have LiDAR on drones. We have been flying just, you know, last spring, which take one point every five centimeters. So just to give you an idea of, of the resolution, but still, with this resolution, we still have kind of incredible results. We thought, okay, this resolution show us a lot of new archeological information. How do I recognize them? Actually, I can tell you if I would have 100 colleagues dedicated to take inch by inch Sweden and see under forests and recognizing these things, we will fail. It's too much. It's really too much because we need to recognize them and then go and walk and see. So there is no possibility of really understanding by ourselves as humans analyzing all this data. So then what we did was through LMK and Crackpot, we received funding for actually training and you know, deep learning uh, um, actually. So for actually I, a postdoc, and she developed this UNET, the deep learning for automatically recognizing these features for us. But it was not just a classification because the algorithm learn from your feedback. So we have to tag a lot of images and then when the algorithm was telling us, look, this is actually what they found, we have to walk and say yes and no. We informed the algorithm, the algorithm was better and better and better. And so the idea was to create, and we, I think we did it, we created a network or a system which could, you know, starting from a small portion, you know, learning, 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 and then analyzing the very entire data set. This was very successful because we could actually verify this also for another reason. You need to know that. Sweden uh, is all there is a, a sort of web GIS accessible for everyone, and you is called a full sock, which I'm quite sure I just you know mis mispronounced that, which is informing you about the location of all the archaeological sites in Sweden. So you can actually go there and see, and then there are also investigation diaries. Uh, you know, you can really have an understanding of what, and but there are a lot of black spots where there is nothing. So our experiments say, well, you know, let's use the algorithm in this area. And let's see, you know, if recognize the same things which are recognized in, uh, which are already visible in full sock. But also let's see if something is recognized in area in which full sock doesn't say anything. And consider that if full sock doesn't say anything, it doesn't mean that there is nothing. It simply means that no archeologists passed there. This was an area where completely blind from full sock. So, and this was a huge amount of sites. We went field working there. We recognized them. Most of them were correct. They were non-correct. 
yeah, we, we actually gave the information to the algorithm in order to get better and better. And, uh, oh, sorry, it was a spoiler. Oh, well, uh, yeah. And actually, I can tell you that you know what is the next problem, and it's fantastic because um, we're really engaging with machine control people, uh, is surveying. Once I know where they are, how do I verify? Because you know you need to have someone going there and verifying. It. So now we just submitted an application in WhatsApp with the, uh, two colleagues from machine control. And the idea was actually to see if we can get that from autonomous systems, robots, to go and assess this. Because you know we have robots like Spot, the dog, with sensors, lidars, and many other sensors, and understanding, I know, but otherwise we'll do this thing, right? not us, right? So, but it's to understand if actually we can use the autonomous system for verifying this. And we believe that this actually can have exceptional impact in many ways. Of course, this doesn't take us out of the pictures. We are always there and we are always the last assessing the data, but trust me, there is no chance otherwise to control and check all this data. It's too much. So part of this research is, uh, of course, is published, which is recently published, many of this research in this book and it's open access, of course. So if you are interested, you can download and, and read more about some of the experiments. But before, this is just half of it, yeah? Uh, I want to discuss and address another, another question. How do we archive this data? Now, we think to the archiving part in a very old style, don't we? So it's like, oh, it's a boring part. Oh, now I need to put these things available or run. But in reality, actually, is, is the next opportunity, is the closest thing. I mean, the archiving is not anymore the last part of the process. Actually, is the beginning because we use so much archive data. So the idea of creating or investigating archives that allow us to do research is fundamental for progressing in research. It's the only chance probably we have as humans, slow humans, as, as, as uh, you know, to actually catch up with all this. And I wanted to bring you in another place now. Looking at our information uh, and for example, physical archives are organized. We can't miss noticing that space and records are part of the same design and often reflect physical representation, the so-called memory palaces of the Loche. Everything was designed to let the user live the whole experience, retrieve, read, compare, and most importantly, enjoy the records. Because knowledge production is a process in which all these aspects and even more are included. So libraries, archives, and collection are incubators of knowledge in which objects that embody different meanings in different words are actually available. How do we bring this multidimensionality or multi-operability into a virtual world? What are the challenging ahead of us? So we need to start considering virtual data at the same level of physical data. And where do we start? So I think archaeology in this case is an excellent example. About 3D models and space, we can learn a lot from past experience. And an interesting example uh, of, uh, of this can be identified in the plaster test. Uh, that was a very diffuse practice for generation, for generating collections. Those were replicas, twins, just copies. However, we should not forget that it is through these copies that many archaeologists build their knowledge. Despite being considered children of a lesser god, those artifacts had an original impact on our formation. And nowadays, those possess unique identification number, are preserved, and are subject to the same regulation as their original. So despite being copies, these records were constantly reused. And because of their function, they quickly formed the same location in the museums, archives, and collections. So how do we trigger a similar process for our digital archives and collections? Because it's crucial. I mean, we cannot just think to an archive as a parking lot, or actually you pay the data there and that is done. It's completely different. We need to see how this impact our knowledge. Do they have an impact? Because it's so expensive actually to write metadata to save this data. So do we need to save it all or not? Or part of it? Well, let's actually look first how they impact our life and how actually what are the potential of impact in our life. And I think that COVID was actually my opener. A nice opener in this. The last decade has been characterized by considerable investment worldwide to establish data platform to, pro to promote large scale research and innovation in the cultural heritage sector and not just in the cultural heritage sector. 
Also very useful, these platforms were never designed to support a deep interaction with the digital materials, nor to promote any specific new research approach. These limits became actually evident during the pandemic, in which suddenly digital collections were no longer just reference sources, but the only available sources for carrying out research. So the situation underlying the urgent need to research strategies for the, for the definition of digital collection as a primary tools for undertaking research and for fully supporting scholars operating in the digital space. So that's why I say it was, a, it was an eye opener because it mainly made clear the fact that a lot of investment, which we did with, with tax money in Europe were actually mainly for letting us, telling us where the things were rather than for engaging with these things. It was a very, I want to take that as a schemorphism of practice karma. It's part of the process, of course. But I mean, these were also a lot of money, right? So we need definitely now, I think, to move on and to understand how actually to make this collection, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as a central part of our research rather than for sharing this. And then, oops, that was actually uh, one slide too much. Yes, uh, recently at the department, we started a small project in collaboration with uh, a group of colleagues from the, uh, from the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History, and also in collaboration with the Lund Historiska Museet, um, Lund University Historiska Museet. Uh, we started, this was actually just before pandemic, we started 3D scanning with high resolution, um, uh, uh, sorry, we, <laughs> we started 3D scanning artifacts from the reference collection. We wanted to understand, okay, what can we do with the 3D artifacts? Because at the moment, you can see a lot of 3D models, and what you can do, rotate them in the net, it's, interesting for three, five seconds, and then what? The question is, you know, the wow effect get very, very much, you know, exhausted immediately. So we thought, no, we need actually to have an archive, but also a tools which is going to make, um, you know, to promote this deep interaction. And actually then it came COVID. Uh, and it was interesting to see how very skeptical also, or, you know, less interested. I would say people on that, they start being extremely interesting because suddenly that was the only way for them to have access to a very good collection of artifacts with all tools for measuring, collecting. I'll show you a lot of things that can be done. You know, uh, Lund, but also Stockholm, suddenly Oslo, many other universities start actually using it. And we could check on the, on the, on the server statistics on how much this was used. It was completely open access and but uh, who's not really looking at the model. He allowed to retrieve a lot of information from those and also extract information and also annotating your thoughts because you sh we should not forget that we progress by climbing giant shoulders or, for, or at least to see, you know, to start from, from where actually the, another researcher stopped. So we start actually thinking to all this. And for example, yeah, this is available online. Actually, you can access from your computer if you like, uh, but you can make sections, you can measure every single angle. And also we thought um, something I think quite important was, um, yeah, you see very often it's all about extracting information, right? You know, the difference between ethic and ethic. So what is actually the objective data? But we don't make research only on objective things. We make research taking these objective things and discussing it with each other. That is how we do. So it's not just us. So what we thought was good to do was actually creating on the web page. So this is all online. You don't need to install any software, anything. You just go there and use the models. There are now 420 from three different Swedish museums and are increasing because we've got fundings for the next five years to do that. You can annotate for your notes or your ideas. So you have an artifact, you start brainstorming. Then, you know, you can measure it, but also annotate all the measurement here. But then you can create an animation. So you place the artifacts in different places. You click on this button, you annotate. And basically when you finish, you click these buttons and you see the animation of the artifacts according with your thoughts. So it's creating a narrative, it's helping the reader or yourself to understand how did you reach that conclusion. And that's, also allow to pinpoint specific areas in which a sample has been taken. For example, you have an artifact and you have chemical sample from conservation or other type of samples, and then you can technically 
create different samples, annotated with colors, sites, and then the description of it. So, and what is particularly interesting about this, and at the end of it, because you know, we also have uh, uh, we also have uh, ethical pro uh, no ethical intellectual properties things. Yeah. So <clears throat> we don't. All this is done on your computers through our server, but none of this is downloaded on our server. So once you finish your job, you just export, you get a JSON file, and then you send it to who you want, to yourself, to other people, you send it to your students, they just download it, they go on the dynamic collection, and they load it, and on their computer, they see all your thoughts. So, but never pass through our server. So we only provide basically the tool for constructing knowledge. And of course, now our teacher are also, you can also create collection with artifacts which are stored in different, uh, in different places. But it's very interesting. And I think this is a, a movie. Probably. Really, and giving the possibility to other researchers to engage not with just with their perspective, but also with your perspective, because they could read what you wrote, what has been your annotation. We can store them here if we get the permission from the user. So you can, of course, manipulate the lights, notice things which are invisible. Now we actually enter a new page and well, now we enter a tool. It's pretty nice because um, it gives you the sites and calculates the volume, not the volume of the object, but the volume of a, of a block. So you can immediately understand from the net. You can actually use a CT scan or what kind of instruments can actually you can you can <laughs> this could be incorporated. So it's also it's sort of logistic practical thing. And in this case, you can actually oops, uh, it's probably restarted. You can also create your collection, saving it, annotating it. And sending to whoever you want, and of course there is a there is a um, there is also a reference on the bottom, uh, and also another article from uh, uh, co-authored with other colleagues, which you will find Eckengren as a first uh, first author. And then Svedigark, this is the uh, VR national infrastructure in digital archaeology. Uh, we we have we got six years financing from VR. And uh, there are several universities. Uh, it's led by Uppsala, then there is Lund, Umeå, Stockholm, there is Ritson Tivorian, there is uh, Karlstad, I hope, Jotabori, so it's a large network. I hope I haven't forgot anyone. But please, I invite you all to see the website just to be sure that's, you know, to get all the information. And we um, coordinate the module on the future of uh, uh, digital archaeology. So we basically, in Lund, we are in charge of coordinating the, all the all the new technology, well, better understanding, coordinating activities, which are meant to better understand the impact of uh, this new technology within archaeological practice. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>